न्यूज फर्स्ट न्यूज लाइन विद फराज शौकटाली एंड जॉली गुड मॉर्निंग टू इट इज This is Newsline live from the News First studios in Dorset Street in Clambo broadcasting on TV1 which is a proud member of the Capital Maharaj group and uh, joining us this morning is uh, a naval man former navy commander author and he's right here with us Admiral Jayanath Kolumke actually Admiral Dr Jayanath Kolumke very good morning to you Admiral good morning to you Faraz and um Welcome to the show. Um Thank you. why doctor? You've you've got a uh, uh, doctorate, PhD? Yes, I did the PhD from the Kotalawala Defence University. Right. In fact, I'm the first uh, PhD graduate from the Kotalawala Defence University. Right. And uh, this is after I retired from the Navy, I obtained that. Right. But I started it while I was working in the Navy. while you were at sea yes uh, well uh, at that time i was the commander right so i started uh, the phd in 2012 and finished in 2015 right the the author of the book asymmetric warfare at sea what commander is asymmetric warfare well asymmetric uh, means the difference the difference in the force level difference in the strength Now if you narrate this to the Sri Lankan context yeah. and if you narrate this to the Sri Lanka Navy and the LTT is Sea Tigers yeah now the Sri Lanka Navy was the bigger force organized raised trained equipped and the uh, LTT is Sea Tigers were the smaller force now in order for them to match the bigger navy mm. the Sea Tigers use various asymmetric tactics and by doing so they became a force to reckon with at sea mm. and uh, it also doesn't mean that the weaker force is using asymmetric tactics all the time mm. uh, there was a time even the sri lankan navy used some of the asymmetric tactics used by the ltte to uh, fight against the ltte you borrowed something from their book well uh, when you realize that uh, you're not winning the way you should mm. then you have to explore ways and means and find out what is the best way to win um so well, i'm right to my in saying that uh, the asymmetric uh, aspect is where one tries to make up for uh, 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 the gap yes that's the, true the missing yeah. equipment yes. the missing whatever force level whatever do you think though that the ltt made up for their lack of equipment numbers and so on and maybe professionalism but do you think they made up the gap by their commitment their will well uh, in fact yes they did i mean they especially i'm talking about the ltt is sea tigers yeah. of course sea tigers uh, were pretty much part of the overall strategy of the ltt e right. and uh, the sea tigers played a crucial role in the racing development and the sustenance of the LTTE mm. and the LTTE sea tigers when they when they started in the uh, early 1980s yeah. they were a very small uh, force right. they were they had very few boats uh, with fiberglass boat dinghies and few rifles mm. but then later on they became a de facto navy mm. i mean they had attack craft they had logistic craft and they had an international uh, shipping network mm. and they were impl- they were able to penetrate and attack uh, many of the harbors in the country mm-hmm. and the sri lanka navy lost uh, maybe more than 20 ships so that means they have raised their level of efficiency the re- level of as a as a naval man did you now you may be able to say it you've left and so on but um as long as you don't risk your pension all right um As a naval man sometimes did you sit back and reflect and think hey those guys did they they really did well because they were a bunch of nobodies as you as you say well uh, i mean that is something which came out of my thesis book as well right i mean the, some of the organizational drawbacks yeah. which the navy had to undergo or the navy went through yeah. gave rise to the ltte sea tigers right and when i say organizational drawbacks it means at the policy level strategic level right. and even tactical level 
Right. So there were certain areas that we didn't do well, right. and that gave rise to the LTTE. So yes, they, they were they became a force to reckon with. Mm. And how many vessels do you think that they managed to have in the end? Well, they had uh, different size uh, of vessels. They had small attack craft, then logistic craft, and then they had submersibles, not right. submarines, but submersible where. They are floating in the water, but maybe one-third is under the water. Right. And, uh, of course, the, the number varied. Mm. I mean, at uh, any time, they would have had, like, altogether maybe, like, 100 craft. Mm. And they had a fleet of ships, uh, about 12 to 15 uh, merchant vessels right. operating for them, uh, themselves. Now, when you say operating for them and that they had... Were they the owners of this, so they, they were front companies? Well, it, it was the, the, the master plan of the LTTE. I mean, mm. they, their sea tigers were not really limited, although they were initially limited to the fighting in the territorial waters. Mm. Gradually, they expanded their horizon to the exclusive economic zone of Sri Lanka, and then they went beyond that. So then there were three components in this uh, international logistic network. Mm. One was the raising of the funds, other one is purchasing of weapons, ammunition and other equipment which are needed for them to fight the war. And the third component is stockpiling them in their ships. Mm -hmm. Now the saddest part is they were able to do this in this international system mm -hmm. by using international harbors, international shipping lanes and to transfer these weapons to the areas controlled by the LTTE. Mm -hmm. So their network was very far and uh, wide. And um, what do you think happened to them? How many of these vessels did the Sri Lankan Navy destroy? Well, I believe out of the uh, about 12 uh, uh, merchant vessels were destroyed by the Sri Lanka Navy and at uh, even by, by combining with the Sri Lankan Air Force. And uh, we captured one vessel after the war ended and brought to Sri Lanka. And then one vessel was uh, used to carry a large group of uh, displaced personnel or the human uh, smuggling to Canada. Mm. So we believe around uh, 9 to 10 ships were destroyed by the naval action. And so when the war ended, how, how many do you think they had left? Well, I believe they had maybe two or three left. But then thereafter, uh, they did not use them for war. I mean, there was no war. And, I, and I'm asking the question that everybody knows I'm going to ask. What happened to them? What happened to these vessels? Well, I told you, one, we uh, apprehended and brought uh, the ship to Sri Lanka. Right. The one went to Canada with uh, a group oh, of that, uh, refugees. Yeah, uh, okay. the, the, the ship went to Canada. And um, other, because, uh, you know, when they are not engaged in any legal activity, they become a legal ship, right. a bona fide right. uh, ship. Okay. So that uh, I don't know what happened to the third ship. Do hmm. you think it ended up in the hands of some politician in Sri Lanka? I doubt very much uh, because there was no need for it. If hmm. a politician wanted, he could have bought a ship. But uh, uh, I don't think it ended up in no, that way. I had to ask the question, so I <laughs> asked it, okay? Um, <clears throat> I had to because I, I, I want to know myself because there's so much. You know, when you sit down and you. Uh, have a have a cup of tea or a coffee, and you discuss these things. So yes. these are the matters that are that come up, and that's, that's actually right. true. Um, right now, for example, you know the the people can't stop talking about corruption, uh, and so it's it's like that. There's no nobody will have any proof what they may have, but it, it's a reflection of people's concern. Uh, and the people uh, wondering what's happening. Uh, but this, uh, so you think that the LTT uh, were able to make up for their, for the lack, lack of, lack of uh, asymmetry, what, uh, yes, um, by their will. Yes, that's true. Actually, if you really look at the history of maritime terrorism, yeah. uh, no other organization has come even closer to the LTTE maritime terrorism or the Mar LTT Sea Tigers. Because the LTTE made the maritime strategy pretty much a key area of their grand strategy. Did they understood the sea did, better. Did you all, and I mean the senior people at the Navy, did you all have a bit of sort of grudging respect for these fellows 
well i don't want to call it respect but i think uh, you have to give due credit even That's to your true. enemy yeah. yeah even to your enemy so sri lanka navy i think did a very clever thing by learning from mistakes uh, over a period of time but overall uh, commander um, uh, admiral um, overall don't you think that if you went into looked at it and thought to yourself what could have been uh that so much of talent all this talent if we harnessed the talent of the navy the yes. the, the legitimate navy and the talent of this de facto navy yes, right. um it would have been uh, you'd have had a lot of lot of competition well i think if it was used for the right purpose yes, for the sake of the I mean, country if you were able yes. to harness yeah ob- uh, obviously that. i mean uh, they are ingenuity Yeah. their innovation yeah. their research yeah. and uh, their commitment to the cause and if those things were used for the betterment of the country and the betterment of the society i'm sure we would have had a different uh, sri lanka today indeed and that was the uh, the tragedy of the war was well unfortunately yes because we were for nearly 3 decades we were engaged in a war fighting amongst ourselves among, among our own people destroying each other destroying the property of each other Indeed. this is our country this is one country one, one small country. place yeah. so we we actually retarded our progress for nearly 3 decades while the other countries were moving ahead that's right so the regional power yes. of, uh, our neighbors got on with it got on with it and we were quite high if you look at 1960s yeah. we were high in every sense whether it is literacy whether it is economy whether it is infrastructure many social indexes so, but then so many lack. opportunities lost of us missed yeah so missed um sad actually uh but come on um, i mean i want to ask you when you the commander of the vessel and you're out at sea um how uh, how much aware are you of you know in terms of responsibility wise you have all these uh, sailors everybody yes. else yes. on board and you are you know you're the master of the vessel mm-hmm. and all these chaps and girls and boys they've got uh they've got families hopes mm-hmm. aspirations and so on and they must have been okay frightened or well concerned. so yes. how 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 aware were you of this responsibility Well, when when you are at sea on a ship, uh, you become a small family, and you are the father. As the captain, you are the father. Right. So, like the father should know about uh, all his children. Yeah. So, it is the responsibility of the commanding officer to know the men right. and what their problems are, what their fears are, especially. So, you keep talking to them when you are at sea. I mean, uh, you have uh, certain duties to perform. Yeah. But at the same time, you have enough time to interact with your own team. Right. And they are the understanding that you know you can survive only as one team. Every member is equally important at that point. Your total survival depends on the teamwork. So, therefore, that comradeia, the 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 team spirit. is naturally building up but it's up to the captain to ensure that it goes in the right direction so captain has to speak to the men give them confidence share things share your experience share your expertise share the things that you have gone through and i want to ask you this these the young naval you know the young yeah. sailors um who joined the navy how much of that was patriotic uh commitment and how much was it um because it was a job well i think it is both i mean it was a job yeah. but you know most of the people who joined the navy yeah knew there was a war knew there was a possibility that they could get killed and still they wanted to come and it was the case throughout the war there was no dearth of people joining the navy so having known that you know one day they could uh, risk their life they joined so i think to me it was more patriotism or a commitment to your country than a mere job 
And um, and how are the pension arrangements for these people? Well, it's quite good. I mean, you get about 85% of your last drone salary if you stay uh, the total period uh, of like 55 years, uh, up to the age of 55 years. And um, in the case of sailors, uh, there is this rule that they will have to leave after serving 22 years. Mm -hmm. So they get a fairly a decent pension, mm -hmm. but they are young. I mean, they are like 42, 44 years so of age. what do they age. do then? Well, that's the problem in Sri Lanka because mm. there is uh, so far no proper scheme to absorb this most valuable human resource because they are trained, disciplined, courageous people and then they have to find jobs for themselves. Mm. And people end up, uh, you know, some, some people even end up driving a three-wheeler, uh, doing a small business. So I think we should have a system to harness this expertise uh, to the government as well as to the private sector mm. rather than being a mere a security guard or doing a job which anyone can do. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a wealth of uh, human resource. And do you, again as a, as a former Navy man, do you feel that there is a, um, a genuine gratitude being expressed by the nation to these people who uh, risked life for country? Well, you know, in the Navy, we call ourselves, we are performing a silent service. We don't make too much noise about what we are doing and people don't also see what we are doing because yeah. we are uh, working there, hey. beyond the horizon. Yeah. Right. So uh, we don't really do things because we expect a gratitude. But I think it's a uh, nature uh, that you would expect uh, a gratitude. But I believe like in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, you know, all the soldiers, sailors became war heroes. They were treated as war heroes. And uh, there were many things done to improve and enhance their welfare. Was it? Yeah, uh, it, it was asking. done uh, quite, uh, I think, quite well done. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, still continuing. That is to look after these veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise it, they can become a social stigma as well. Mm -hmm. When you are not having a job once you leave, you know, your mind wanders. So Indeed. there has Indeed. to be, I think, a better uh, coordinated program uh, for the future. Um, th that's good because we, we always are a little bit uh, concerned uh, because we don't really want uh, these uh, war heroes uh, to end up as a sort of a forgot as as a component of what I call the forgotten people of Sri Lanka, yeah. uh, like the rural areas, its poverty yes. and so on, uh, which Gamada movement has uh, yes. has discovered, um, and so it's essential for I think so, yes. for the country. Um, you know, history will record these yes. as uh, as heroes, um, and so for the country to uh, be continuously grateful. I think uh, they should, yes. We, we are getting um, some questions coming in, and uh, <clears throat> uh, this, here's one. Uh, can you explain the role played by Melinda Morgan, a led organization in which you function <laughs> as a top man? What is the role of for foreign funded NGOs? What, 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 what role do these foreign NGOs play? Well, actually, uh, right now, uh, I work as a director in the Pathfinder Foundation right. under uh, former Minister Milinda Moragoda. What do you all do? So we basically try to uh, develop our linkage with India and uh, another direction with China. So we really want to be a platform where we can discuss uh, contentious issues pertaining to the relations between these two uh, giant powers in the Indian Ocean right. and uh, so uh, like a, to become like a bridge between right. these two powers mm -hmm. uh, to discuss various economic aspects and uh, maritime security aspects and development aspects. So we want to create that forum mm -hmm. where the intellectuals, the academics, the policy makers uh, and the, even the government uh, uh, officials can discuss these issues and come up with some policy formulations which would benefit the whole region, which would benefit Sri Lanka. And uh, so that's basically the task of the Pathfinder Foundation. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and, uh, and a very uh, sort of um, uh, 
an important role? Well, I think yes, it is important because uh, we should do this at each level, not only at the top government level, uh, not only at the private sector level, but yeah. in between as well. Um, I see. And, um, you know, the, this is the book uh, that um, I don't know where I'm going to do this. There you go. And uh, that, that's the book, uh, Asymmetric Warfare at Sea. Um, and um, that's uh, written by uh, Admiral Dr. Jan, Jana Kolumbage, and it's published by Lambert Academy Publishing. And um, also, uh, you know, thank you. Uh, uh, you you gave us some of these books and yes. autographs, and uh, we will settle up with you uh, <laughs> because. Uh, uh, goodness me, is, uh, uh, there are lots of questions. What are your views on Sri Lanka expanding its influence in its um, economic zone and its uh, search and rescue capability? People don't understand this need. Well, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have this uh, concept or the phenomena called the sea blindness. You yeah. don't understand what you don't see. But I think the potential of this country lies in the blue ocean. Right. And the best advantage or the best resource we have is the location. Yeah. We are in the center of the Indian Ocean and we have been a hub of maritime activities in the centuries gone by. Mm. And our future lies in the blue ocean economy in terms of maritime commerce and also looking for resources ocean bed resources mm. uh, for our sustenance, maybe living resources, maybe non-living resources. Uh, so our future lies in the blue ocean economy. And therefore, we must pay more attention uh, for maritime strategy, maritime aspects, including the Navy. Navy is part of the maritime strategy. There are many other things. So we must, uh, you know, we have been talking about the advantage of this geographical position for decades. So we have to really make it happen now. Otherwise, you know, other countries are moving ahead. And uh, so we, have, we are blessed with many things, not only the location, the deep water ports. Yeah. No other country in the Sark region has these deep water ports. We are blessed with that. Mm. And we have navigable water almost around our country. And we are located just uh, 12 nautical miles uh, north of the busiest shipping lane in the Indian Ocean. Talking about that is a question that obviously from uh, somebody with uh, the sort of maritime background, I think. How was it possible during your command to have a vessel loaded with arms and ammunition to be in the Gaul Harbour when it should have been 12 nautical <coughs> miles OPL Gaul? Didn't it also violate ISPS compliance issues? Well, I think, I, I don't think I should get into that uh, yeah. because it was a controversial issue which has gone to the courts also. Right. Uh, basically, what I can say is the Navy functions under the Ministry of Defense yeah. and it follows the guidelines, directives, rules promulgated, issued by the Ministry of Defense. Mm. And uh, everybody knew this uh, ship was there in Gaul Harbor. Yeah. It was not a secret. The police knew, the Navy knew, Navy people were on board. So everything happened according to the directives of the Ministry of Defense. So there was, I, to my, uh, observer, my observation, there was no wrongdoing done in that. Uh, so I, I don't want to get into no. that issue That's beyond right. that. Um, and uh, uh, another question from another viewer uh, is asking whether uh, the organization that you spoke of before with Pathfinder, uh, can you help Sri Lanka fight the allegations being made in Geneva? Well, we have not really focused as Pathfinder uh, on that, but uh, we are, as I mentioned, we are creating a platform to discuss all these issues, mm -hmm. not only by Sri Lankans, yeah. but the people who have these concerns, yeah. people who have these, uh, the, the concern about human rights violation. So we are not averse to talking about it, mm -hmm. but we have not really gone into that level right. um, in projecting ourselves. Um, and... Uh uh, do you think, uh, w w what happens to uh, a post-war scenario now? Uh, does the Navy need to be uh, trimmed down in numbers or does it need to be maintained? Uh, what, what's, the, uh, what's the rationale? Well, I would say we are an island nation. 
and all around us is the ocean yeah. and we are in the best location in the indian ocean yeah. and i think we paid dearly for not developing a navy over a, the whole of our history mm. and to me the best use of the navy was uh, immediately after the british left in 1957 that was the height of the uh, the naval forces but thereafter i believe the successive governments did not play sufficient attention to the development of the navy and we paid dearly for it so i would say that uh, being an island nation being surrounded by the sea uh, located among the busiest uh, shipping lane in the world and our navy should be the first line of defense and therefore we need to develop our navy because not only that the territorial so we need to spend a bit more money than yes of course now. we have to because it's not only the territorial waters the exclusive economic zone of our country has to be surveillance uh, under surveillance monitored and patrolled and then even so beyond that needs to be looked after i think so uh, i see um i uh, i just want to ask you this you know um uh how long uh, did you spend you know when you were at sea how long did you spend there at any one time well it depend on the ship uh, or the craft that you serve sometimes yeah. it was 21 days at sea and mm. sometimes it was 7 8 days 21 days we got come back to shore well yes there were times uh, we had enough sea. food and more well combo. food we were okay but then there were occasions that we had to take uh, replenishment right. but the water was a major problem at sea the mm. fresh water uh, so you have to ration the water and sometimes you have to live with a one bucket of water fresh water so there was a permanent drought it seems well yes although you are surrounded by, by water. water it's not uh, good for you to dr- you can't drink it uh, but you know when you are at sea you survive you live you learn to live at sea i see um i see um admiral um you must have uh, shared in um the news that uh, the sri lankan cricket team has yes. uh, performed uh, very well indeed and Excellent. they have won and there you go there's uh, there's a clip from the match wow um, and they did pretty well didn't they well i i watched the match yesterday oh. it was a brilliant performance chasing 169 runs and winning in south africa against a good bowling attack Uh, I think it's a real good comeback from our Sri Lankan cricket team having lost the test series they came up brilliantly well in the T20s mm. and I wish they will do equally good in the five one day matches as well you know what you sound so you did that so well you need to come and join us as a sports correspondent uh, uh, maybe Mr Jack Sethra will approach you to do what you just did um but it's wonderful that uh, you know sri lanka uh, this sri lankan cricket team is uh, is like a uh, silver lining in a very cloudy world well it is a national symbol i would say Indeed. wherever you go people talk about cricket and we are there it's an ice breaker it is an ice breaker it is an eye opener indeed and uh, we are held in high esteem in that and we love that game wonderful um Uh, Admiral uh, Jayanath, uh, Dr. Jayanath Kolumbage, thank you very much for having been on Newsline. We appreciate your presence and, you know, thank you for the book. Thank you. Um, and uh, we wish you very well and uh, all your efforts at Pathfinder and so on. Uh, do pop by and thank you. Time I will. And keep us uh, informed, keep the public. Thank you very much. And that's it from uh, Newsline this morning. Do uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Take care. Have a great week ahead and God bless. Thank you.